and welcome everybody to this workshop today from Nicola, who has kindly come to talk to us more about tidy models. I hope I got that right. Yes. <laughs> Yay. Over to you. Perfect. Thank you very much. Uh, so I'm just going to share uh, my screen. Okay, and hopefully you can all see that. I'm just going to move uh, Zoom things around so I can actually see them <laughs> a little bit. Okay. Okay, so um, welcome to the introduction to machine learning with Tidy Models Workshop. Um, so just a sort of very brief introduction uh, to myself. Um, I'm a lecturer in health data science based within the Center for Health Informatics, Computing and Statistics in the medical school at Lancaster University. Uh, my background is in statistics and operational research. Um, and I also did some data science consultancy in between uh, my PhD and coming back to academia. And at the moment, a lot of the research I do is in collaboration with uh, local NHS trusts on data science projects in the Northwest. Um, yeah, feel free to introduce yourself in the chat. Um, some of you probably know each other, but some of you might not, and I certainly don't know all of you. Uh, so it would be nice uh, to introduce yourself. So what we're going to do today, um, so the, the workshop will run for two hours. There's going to be a combination of uh, some slides with me talking, uh, some live coding examples, um, and then some exercises for you to participate in. Um, do you feel free to ask questions in the chat throughout. I will probably sort of group your questions together and, and answer them sort of when we're going through the exercises and things like that. Um, and I do hope you end up with sort of more questions than answers after the workshop. Um, so tidy models is a, a huge topic and machine learning is a huge topic and we're not going to get through all of it in two hours. Um, but hopefully this will kind of give you a bit of an idea of how both of those things work. Um, and you can go away and, and ask more questions and find out more things. So there are resources for this workshop. So these slides are available online if you want a copy for yourself or you want to follow along. Um, so the link is there. And what I can do is I can post that in the chat. Okay. And once you have the, the link to the slides, you should have the link to everything else as well. Um, so there's the resources for the workshop are on GitHub as well. Okay. Okay. So you can get all of the, um, everything you need there. We're obviously going to need some data um, for the examples and the exercises today. Um, so we're going to be using two different data sets in the workshop. Uh, so one of them is uh, looking at clinical records for heart failure. Okay, so these data sets are on the Posit Cloud's workspace, um, but they are also available on GitHub. So if you are using your own laptop and running R locally, um, you can download those CSV files. Um, from GitHub, and we will go through that when we get into using the data set. The second data set we'll be using is around um, exercise. Uh, so looking at physical exercise in uh, patients with stroke and looking at sort of follow up after six months. So we'll be looking at both of these data sets today. Okay, so let's get started with looking at tidy models. So what is tidy models? It's essentially a collection of R packages for statistical modeling and machine learning. And as the name sort of suggests, it does follow the tidyverse principles. So if you're familiar with things uh, like dplyr or ggplot2 um, or tidyr, it follows that general same style of, of R packages and functions. So everything is, is generally quite well named and there's functions tend to do one thing and be named based on that one thing that they do. There are much like the tidyverse, there's a sort of core set of tidy models packages, um, which you can run and install with install.packages. But there are a lot of other extension packages that the tidy models team have built, but also some other people have added to as well. 
So these are some of the, the core tidy models packages, and we'll be using uh, most of these uh, today. So you have packages specifically for looking at sampling data. You have packages for processing data. You have packages for uh, evaluating model performance, um, looking at metrics in different ways, tuning hyperparameters, lots of different things. Um, so you'll get some experience of using each of these packages uh, today. And one of the the reasons for using tidy models, okay, so I'll, essentially every machine learning algorithm or statistical model that you can do in tidy models, you could also just do in base R, right? You could install some some other R package that, that fits the model. So why would you why would you do tidy models and and do it that way? The main reason for that is because it sort of standardizes things across different types of models. So if some of you have maybe played around with some different modeling packages before, one thing you might notice is that some models want a data frame as an input, some of them want a matrix, some of them want vectors, and you end up spending quite a lot of time trying to sort of just reformat your data. And it takes up quite a lot of time, but it's not necessarily something that's useful for you. So the idea of tidy models is it sort of standardizes the way you put your data into models and the way that data or sort of summary statistics and results comes out of models. So it makes sort of models comparison a lot easier and it means you can spend more of your time actually doing the modeling part rather than reformatting data, which I think we all spend a lot of time doing, but it's not necessarily always the most fun part. The other sort of component of the workshop is sort of thinking about machine learning. Um, and I think everyone you ask probably has a slightly different definition of what they mean by machine learning. Um, so for the purposes of, of this workshop, I'm essentially thinking about machine learning as being a way of learning from data. And we're going to be mostly looking at it to use to, for making predictions or classifications. Okay? So thinking of, of machine learning is essentially a very small subset of AI, and then the sort of models that we're going to be looking at in the workshop are kind of saying within that, that machine learning bubble. When we think about different types of machine learning, um, initially, typically thinking about two different categories. So you might have uh, supervised learning. So this requires that you have some sort of labeled input data, and then you want to learn what the labels of some other data is. You can have classification-based methods or regression-based methods uh, to do supervised learning. So you, you know what the labels are for uh, the outputs. In contrast to that, you can also have unsupervised learning. So this is where you don't have labeled input data and you're just sort of trying to learn, for example, what different clusters, so what different observations in your data are similar to each other or which ones are different from each other. There are other types of machine learning that you might hear a little bit about. Um, so things like semi-supervised learning and reinforcement learning, uh, but we're not going to touch on those today. OK, so before we start actually fitting models, we do need to think a little bit about our data and what we want to do to our data before we fit models. So when we're doing machine learning, one of the first things we typically do is split our data into training data and testing data. So for our training data, we use this for model development. So we might try different models, um, estimate different parameters, and essentially use this training data to figure out what the best um, settings for a particular model are. And then we have our testing data set, and we use that to evaluate the final model. Okay. So it's really important when we're doing machine learning that none of the testing data is used to actually fit or uh, develop the model. Here we, all, we always want to be evaluating our final model based on some sort of clean slate of unseen data that, that the model has never seen before. When we're doing training models, if you think about something uh, like regression, okay, so something very kind of straightforward, you put your data in and then you can estimate the best value of a parameter from the data, 
Okay, you can get the coefficients out in your linear regression model just from the data that you have. There's some models where you can't necessarily estimate the best value of a parameter just from the data. So these are typically called hyperparameters. And what you typically have to do is try a bunch of different values and then pick the one that works the best. So within the training set of your data, you do some further splitting of your data. Okay? So you might split your data so that 90% of it is going to be what we call the sort of training folds. And then we have this test fold. So it's the same sort of procedure. We'll pick a particular value of the hyperparameter. We'll fit it to 90% of the training data, evaluate it in the test fold of the training set. And we'll do that lots of different times. And we'll do it for lots of different values of the hyperparameter. And then we can choose the best one. Within tidy models, there's some nice tools that help you do these different steps. Okay? Um, and it, tidy model sort of has its own terminology that might feel a little bit confusing or a little bit unusual. So the kind of two key things in tidy models when we're sort of doing this pre-processing before we get to fitting models is thinking about recipes and workflows. Okay. So when we talk about recipes in tidy models, this is essentially a series of pre-processing steps that you perform on the data before you fit a model. Okay. So this might be things like making dummy variables. Okay. So if you have uh, different categories, or it might be things like uh, normalizing your data. So maybe you want to put all your data on a scale of between zero and one. And that's something that you're going to want to do regardless of what model you actually fit and then you can put it all into a recipe of a set of pre-processing steps we also have workflows in uh in tidy models so this is essentially the next step which combines those pre-processing steps with the modeling and potentially some post-processing steps as well so the idea is basically combine this recipe of pre-processing with a model. OK, so let's go and look at an example of doing some pre-processing in tidy models. OK, so what I'm going to start off with is um, I'm going to make this. Oh, sorry, that was my fault. Um, All right. Give me a second. I'm going to get the. No, I'm not. I'm going to. That was me. Sorry. I'll, I'll just share the link with everybody. But okay, I perfect. Accidentally yeah. pushed you out. Sorry. All right. What I am going to do is uh, make the the font a little bit bigger, so it's a little bit easier for people to see. So I know the one when you're on Zoom, it can be a little bit hard to see cold. Okay. Um. If the the code or the, the text is still too small, please do um, leave a message in the chat and just, just let me know. Um, but what we're going to start off with is uh, loading some R packages. Okay. Um, so we're going to start off, because we're doing pre-processing and reading in our data, we're going to load in tidyverse um, to start off with. And then we're going to also load in uh, the sort of base tidy models packages. Okay. Um, so if you're using the posit cloud workspace, you should have them sort of pre-installed. Um, you just need to load them in. If you are running it locally as well, you might need to do install.packages uh, tidy models as well. And then before we move on to the next step, I'm also going to run this uh, tidy models prefer uh, function. So there are some functions in tidy models which have the same name as some functions in other packages. And this is basically saying use the tidy models version. 
um, of these functions. Okay, so it kind of helps with conflicts and it saves you having to namespace everything. Um, you can run tidy models prefer to say use the, the version of functions from tidy models. Okay, and then we're going to load in some data. Okay, so for the examples here, I'm going to run uh, using the heart failure data. So we're going to do read uh, CSV and the the two data sets we'll be using in the workshop are in uh, this data folder. Okay, so we'll start with the heart failure one. Okay, so we can have a little look at that data. Okay, we can use the view function um, to put it in a nice human readable format. Okay, so we have uh, essentially every row is a different patient, a different person, and then we have different characteristics on them. So we have sort of age, sex, uh, whether they smoke, um, and then some binary variables based on uh, whether they have a particular condition. And then we also have some other uh, continuous numeric variables here. And then right at the end, we have a binary column uh, indicating uh, death, um, so zeros and ones. Um, and that's the, the outcome we're going to be modeling. So for almost all um, models where you have a binary outcome, okay, so it's a zero and a one or a yes or a no, these need to be factors. Okay, so at the moment they are zeros and ones, and when R sees zeros and ones, it just thinks numbers. So the first thing we're going to do is change that death column into a factor. Okay, so you can use the, the mutate function from dplyr to just change this into a factor. Okay. So that's something that you might have done before if you're doing anything with uh, sort of logistic regression, um, is making sure that you do have uh, categories for your outcomes of zeros and ones. And as with any sort of project where you're using data, um, I do think the first thing you should do is look at your data. So make some plots. Um, of the outcome and of the different potential explanatory variables. Okay, so we can have a little look at the data. Um, I do love ggplot2 a lot, but for my initial exploratory um, plots, I do almost always just use base R because it is sort of very quick, even if it's a little bit less pretty. Okay, so you can look at your outcome. Okay, so you've got almost. Um, twice as many zeros as once. Okay, so it's um, a little bit imbalanced. We can also look at, for example, uh, the distribution of uh, males and females in the data set. Okay, and in the data set here, you have almost twice as many uh, males as females. You also might want to look at the uh, distribution of age. Okay, so you might want to make a histogram here. Okay, so you can see that sort of uh, medians probably sitting somewhere around sort of 55 to 60 ish. Okay, so it is quite useful to start looking at the distribution of different variables, particularly thinking about the range of values uh, that different uh, variables in your data um, can take. Okay, as you'll see um, in a little while, when you're doing things like pre processing, you might want to normalize some of your variables so that they're all on the same scale. Okay, so when you're looking um, at your data here, okay, you've got different continuous variables. So you have age, okay, so that's going between sort of 40 and maybe 95. But then you're looking at some of your other continuous variables and that's saying uh, maybe between sort of zero and seven ish or something like that. So they're on a very different scale. Okay, so we'll look in a second about how we might want to, to deal with that. Okay, but what we're going to start off with first before we start pre-processing stuff is we're going to split things into 
uh, our training and testing sets, okay? So in tidy models, um, there's essentially three functions uh, that we'll use to make training and testing sets. So one of them is called initial split, and that, as the name suggests, performs that initial split of the data. And then there's two other functions. One is called training and one is called testing. And it basically pulls out the training set from that initial split or pulls out the testing set from that initial split. It does perform a random initial split. And as soon as we're working with any sort of randomness, what we usually want to do is use set.seeds. Okay. And I just make sure that our results are reproducible. So that if you give your code to someone else and they run it, you want to make sure that they're using the same random split as you. Okay. So you can pick any uh, random seeds you like. I always use the date because then I don't really have to think about what random seed I'm going to use. So let's make our initial split. Okay. So I'm going to call it HF. So for heart failure. Uh, split. And then we're using initial split and just passing in the data set. Okay. And then what we want to do is we actually want to get the, the training data set and the test data set. So we can call it HF train. It's going to be training HF split. Okay, and then as you might guess, we have HF test is going to be testing HF split. Okay, so you're passing, you're creating this initial split from the data and then passing the split object into training or testing. Okay, and you can see um, if you look at your environment tab, training data set has about 224 um, and the testing data set has about 75. So by default in tidy models, <clears throat> the initial split function uses a 75 to 25% split. Okay, so 75% training, 25% testing. You might want to have a different split um, proportion. Okay, so you might want um, a smaller uh, testing data set or you might want a larger one. Okay, and it will depend a little bit on what it is you're trying to do, um, how much data you have, um, what exactly those values are. Okay, but it is quite easy to choose a different um, proportion. Okay, so in this initial split function, there is an argument prop. So this is the proportion of data that will go into the training uh, set, okay? So pick a number between uh, zero and one, okay? So if you want an 80% split in your training data, put 0 0.8, for example, okay? So you can see that the training data set is now a little bit larger, okay? Obviously, depending on how many um, observations are in your data set, you might not get exactly 80%, um, but it'll be essentially as close as possible. Okay, so if you'd picked uh, a different random seed, you might get 240 observations rather than 239, for example. The other thing I mentioned was this idea of um, cross validation folds. So when you're I'm trying to choose those hyperparameters for some of your models. You want some different cross validation folds. So we can go ahead and make those at the moment. Okay. So with those cross validation folds, remembering that those are just based on the training data. Okay. So they're used for model development. So we never want to um, base anything on, on the testing data. So we can create, uh, these cross-validation folds. Okay. So there is a function, uh, vfold cv. Okay, so cv for cross-validation. So we pass in 
uh, the training data here. Okay, so HF train. And then we specify how many different cross validation folds we want. So how many of, of those different splits do you want to do? Um, so you might set V is equal to 10 if you want 10 different cross validation folds. Okay. And you can see uh, you have those cross validation folds there. So you have 10 observations. So it's, it's 10 different folds of the data. And then we can start thinking about building a recipe. Okay, so this is the first part where we're starting to think about actually modeling. So thinking about what do you want to model? Okay, so we can create a recipe and as many things are, are well named, we are using the recipe function. Okay? And what goes into the recipe function here is going to be a formula. Okay? So if you have used uh, the LM uh, function in R to fit a linear model, the formula is essentially this, the same thing here. Okay? So we're modeling uh, death. Okay? So that's our outcome, our, our Y variable. And then we have tilde, and then you're going to have your explanatory variables. Um, so what I'm going to do here is I'm actually just going to throw in all of the explanatory variables. Okay, so you can type them out and put some uh, sort of addition terms if you like, but if you just want to add all uh, possible explanatory variables, um, putting a full stop is the quickest way to do that. And we can say that the data we want to, to fit it to is our training data. Okay. So data equals HF train. Okay. And that is a recipe. Okay. That's is all that recipe is specifying is sort of saying what is your outcome and what's your potential explanatory variables. This is also the point though, that we can add in some other pre-processing steps. Okay. So if we go back and look at the data again for a second, okay, what we might want to do is we might want to make uh, this column here into a dummy variable. Okay. R quite often does this quietly in the background. So if you fitted a linear model to something with categories, it makes sort of dummy variables. So they're essentially uh, indicator variables for the different uh, levels of, of those categories. Um, I quite like to be explicit about what steps are being done in the modeling, uh, mainly for myself, so that I know exactly what's going on in the model and the R isn't doing something quietly that I might forget about. So we might want to make these into dummy variables explicitly. Okay? If you had uh, zeros and ones or um, for, for this as well, you might want to make that into uh, dummy variables uh, as well. And I mentioned this already, is we might want to normalize some of these um, numeric variables. Okay, they've all got quite different ranges here. Okay, you've got hundreds of thousands in the platelets column, um, but in the sort of serum, you know, they're all sitting around one-ish here. Okay, so there's a very different range of values there. And some machine learning models handle those different ranges very well, and it doesn't matter that much. Some other machine learning models work much better if all of your explanatory variables are around about the same range. So what we can do is we can normalize those variables. Okay. So what we can do is we can pipe our recipe into some different uh, pre-processing steps. Okay. So we could do uh, step dummy, if you want to make a dummy variable. And what you're doing is you're passing in the column names that you want to apply those pre-processing steps to. Okay. So I'm assuming you're reasonably familiar uh, with sort of dplyr. So the way you specify columns here is the same way you specify columns in things like the select function in dplyr. Okay. And you can add as many steps um, as you like, okay? And if you start 
typing step, you'll get a selection of, okay, here's all of the pre-processing steps that exist. So there are lots of different things you can do uh, to your data. Um, so when it comes to the exercises, you can have a little um, sort of scroll through there and have a look at the different steps you could do. But if you want to normalize your data, you use step underscore normalize. Okay. And I'm going to pass in uh, the age column. And I want to start from this column here and go up to time. Okay. Uh, so you can use a colon to give you a sequence of columns. So from one column up to another. So now we have a recipe. Okay. And if you remember back to the slides, what comes after uh, a recipe is a workflow. Okay. So we have workflow. And then you want to add the recipe to that workflow. Okay. And the recipe that you want to add is the recipe that you've just created. Okay. So this is a very simple workflow. Okay, there isn't um, a lot of steps to it. So we're basically saying create a workflow and use this recipe that we've specified. Okay. You could of course split this up into more steps depending on how many pre-processing steps you have or if you're doing something a bit more complicated. Uh, but here it is sort of quite a straightforward process. Okay, so read in your data, do any um, conversion of of different types that you you need to you could do this in the the pre-processing as well I think but then split your data using the initial split training and testing create some cross-validation folds if you think you might need them make a recipe with your pre-processing steps and then stick them into a workflow okay the nice thing about tidy models is that after this step you don't really need to think about pre-processing, okay? So regardless of which model you're going to fit next or how many different models you're going to fit next, you only need to go through this whole process once, okay? So it's not um, a case of if you want to fit three different models, we'll have to go through this whole thing three times. doesn't matter how many models you're fitting. You only need to do this part once, okay? Um, you're... If you're using Posit Cloud, um, you should have access um, to what I'm kind of going through as well. Uh, but there is a, a, a rough copy of these examples um, on GitHub as well, if you do want a copy um, or if you haven't managed to kind of um, follow through all of the examples. It's now your turn um, to write some R codes. Um, so if you go, if you're in Posit Cloud, and you go into exercises and then go into exercise one. Uh, there's some prompts in here. Uh, they are also on the slides. Okay, so basically load the tidyverse tidy models packages, read in the exercises.csv data, have a little look at the data, um, and then perform that initial split into training and testing. Choose whichever proportion uh, you'd like make some cross validation folds and then build a recipe um, and a workflow. Okay. Um, and when you're looking at the data, it's the SAE is the response variable. So it is also um, a binary uh, zero and one variable. Okay. So if you have a little go at those exercises, um, I will check and see if there's any questions um, in the chat. If you do get stuck, do you just let me know. Um, and if you're, uh, when you get finished with the exercises, if you just drop a note in the chat as well to kind of say uh, that you're done.
So just while you're still working through the exercises, I will answer uh, Rob's question in the chat. So Rob's question was around what rules of thumb would you use for deciding the sort of relative size of the training versus the testing split? So part of me wants to say that the, the default split is the default split for a reason. Okay, so 75 and 25 is is quite common. Um, I actually, I would probably say that 80%, 20% is probably even more common. Generally, what you want to be thinking about is how much data do you need to be quite confident that your model works? So thinking about how big does that testing set need to be for you to be quite confident that, that it's working well. And so that percentage is probably going to vary depending on how big your data set is. So if you have a really, really big data set, so you've got millions and millions of rows, 10% of your data might still be hundreds of thousands of rows of data, okay? And that's probably a, a little bit, almost a little bit too much data to just check that your model works. So you can use a smaller percentage for the testing set if you've got really big data. Okay. But if you've got a really small data set, okay, so you may be only, like in the examples we've got here, we've only got um, sort of a few hundred rows of data. Okay. If you use something like 10% of that, you have maybe only got 20 observations. And thinking about is 20 observations enough to say that a model works? Probably not. So you might want to use something closer to a 50-50 split. Okay, so you can be a little bit more sure that when you're evaluating your models, that you have enough data to to evaluate it. Um, that tends to be how I think about our training and testing splits. So the name of the function, to answer Fran's question, the name of the function that creates the split is uh, initial underscore split. Okay, so you use initial split, pass in your data set and give your proportion, and then use training and testing. Um, Elizabeth's question, um, a little bit more about what the repeats mean. Um, do you mean the sort of cross validation part? This, this sort of part here. Yeah, okay. Um, I'll pop back uh, to the slides for a second. Okay. Um, so the cross-validation folds sort of relate a little bit to the, the hyper-parameter tuning. So this is where you're fitting a machine learning model and you can't estimate the best value of a model parameter from the data. So what you do is you create what you call sort of folds in the in the training data. So you take your training data set and you split it um, again. So 90% of the training set is used um, to uh, test a particular hyperparameter value. And then 10% is used to uh, evaluate that hyperparameter value. And so what these uh, that vfold CV function is doing is basically creating these splits here. So it's a little bit like the initial split function. Okay, so the initial split function takes all of your data, splits it into training and testing. Uh, the vfold CV uh, 
function takes your training data set and splits it into different folds. So a training fold and a test fold. Okay? Um, and choosing uh, v equals 10 determines sort of how many different folds of the data there are. Okay? So this is, it's not, you don't necessarily need these cross-validation folds, these different repeats, if you have a very simple model where you can learn all of the parameters from the data. But if you have hyperparameters that you need to pick values for, you need some some data or some way of, of choosing those values. OK, I can see that most people are uh, finished, which is great. OK, um, there are uh, solutions to the exercises, um, both on Posit Cloud and on GitHub. So if you go into uh, Exercise Solutions folder um, and then Exercise Solutions 1. Um, so if you haven't managed to uh, quite finish all of the exercises, you can use the solutions copy um, because the, sort of, the exercises for the workshop build on each other. Um, so we'll be using these recipes and these uh, different training and testing splits for the next exercises. OK. So we're now finally ready um, to start fitting our first uh, model. Okay. So the first um, sort of model we're going to look at is lasso regression. Okay. So if we go back a little bit first okay, and think about uh, linear regression or logistic regression models. Okay. So you've probably fitted these in R before using either the LM function or the GLM function. Now, one of the things that can be a little bit tricky with these types of models is how do you decide which explanatory variables are going to go into your model? Okay. If you've only got a few, it might be reasonably easy. Okay. If you've got lots and lots of potential explanatory variables, it can be quite hard to figure out which ones are actually important and which ones you're going to put into your final model. Okay. Some people do things like uh, doing different statistical tests and coming up with p-values to try and figure out how um, how strong an association there is between your outcome and a different explanatory variable. Other people use uh, things like stepwise methods, um, so adding in or taking out variables um, one at a time. But all of these approaches kind of have problems okay you can you can sometimes end up with the wrong model okay if, if it doesn't quite go right at the start so ideally what we have is some automated way of figuring out which explanatory variables are important and which ones should be kept in the model okay and luckily there is okay so there's a thing called lasso regression and what you can essentially do is use this to determine which explanatory variables in your regression model are important. So normally when we do regression models, we want to just minimize the distance between the predicted and the observed values. Okay, We want those residuals to be as close to zero as possible. With lasso regression, okay, so least absolute shrinkage and selection operator, we want to we do still want to minimize the distance between the predicted and observed values. But we also want to, we add this sort of penalty term here. Okay, so we have lambda times the sum of the coefficients. Okay, so if you've got lots and lots of variables in your model, then you're going to have lots and lots of coefficients. And so this sum is going to be quite large. Okay, so this helps to essentially protect against having too many coefficients because you want to sort of minimize the sum of the coefficients or minimize the number of them. Okay. So depending on which value of lambda you have will determine exactly what that penalty is and how much you want to penalize having more coefficients or more explanatory variables in your model. Okay. So if you think of each of these lines in this graph here as a different uh, coefficient. 
as you increase lambda, okay, so as you put more of a penalty for having uh, large coefficients, the values start to, sh to shrink towards zero, essentially, okay? So if you look at, uh, for example, this green line here, okay, once you reach for a particular value of lambda, it essentially says, okay, this green coefficient, actually, let's just make it zero, okay? It's not necessarily useful to have that in the model, okay? So it's, it's shrinking down those coefficients and it shrinks some of them to zero. And if you have a coefficient of zero, then that's not a variable that's in your model. Okay. So what you might be thinking is, well, how do you decide what that value of lambda is? How do you decide how big that penalty should be? Okay, it can take any value between zero. Okay, if you if you pick a value of lambda as zero, then that is just standard linear regression. If you pick a really big value of lambda, you're gonna end up with basically more coefficients being pushed towards zero. So you're gonna end up with very few variables in your model. So it could take any value between zero and infinity, essentially. So you've got a lot of choice. How do you decide on what that value is, right? And that's where we come back to those hyperparameters, okay? So the way we choose lambda is we try lots of different values of lambda, and then we pick the one that performs the best. How do you decide which one performs the best is obviously the next question. And again, there's a lot of different ways you can think of a model as being well-performing, okay? So you can look at, if we're sticking with binary data for a second, okay? So that's what we're looking at in the examples and the exercises. So you have different performance metrics. You can look at the things uh, like accuracy, so basically, how, what proportion of the data did you predict correctly? You can also look at uh, ROC curves. Okay, so um, plotting the sort of false positive rate against the true positive rate. Okay, ideally, you want a false positive rate of zero. Okay, and you want a true positive rate of one. So you, you essentially. Um, correctly classified um, all of the the ones and haven't incorrectly classified any of the uh, zeros as ones. Okay, that's that's a perfect world. Um, but what you typically you can look at is the area under the curve. Okay, so if you had this perfect scenario, you'd have um, an area of one. So if you're measuring the area um, underneath, the the higher uh, that area, the better. There's also um, another classification uh, metric, so kappa. So it's a little bit similar to accuracy, um, but it's sort of normalized based on uh, the proportion of ones and zeros in your data set. Okay, so you can imagine a situation where, uh, let's say, the truth is that 99% of your values are ones. If you just say that everything is a one, then 99% of the time you are correct, but that's also a terrible model, okay? So you've you've missed all of the zeros. Um, so Kappa sort of normalizes uh, based on that, whereas accuracy would tell you you're doing very well when you're not. All of these classification metrics are things that you can calculate within tidy models, okay? So it comes from the yardstick package there's lots of other metric types implemented um, in Yardstick. So what I would suggest is you have a little look at that list of metrics and think about what might be appropriate. Okay? And it also has lots of uh, metrics implemented for uh, continuous data. Okay, So if you're not looking at classification problems, maybe you're looking at regression problems, there's different metrics that you can look at there. Okay. Um, would you like a five minute break to get yourself um, a cup of tea or do you want to, to keep going? Um, let me know in the chat what you'd prefer. Yeah, five minutes would be great. Okay, um, so if you come back about 10.33, um, that would be great and we'll crack on with um, some more examples and some more exercises. Okay, um, and just let me know when you're back and ready to get started, all right?
Okay, so uh, before the break, we looked, uh, we had a brief introduction to sort of uh, lasso regression, um, or in, in the case that we're going to be looking at, lasso logistic regression. Okay, so it works exactly the same way, regardless of whether you're looking at a binary outcome or um, a continuous outcome. So let's have a little look, first of all, at how do we, how do, we do these in tidy models? Um, so I'm going to add a section here. Okay. Right, some space. Okay. So the first thing we want to look at is fitting these models. Okay. So we're going to start off with the logistic reg function. Okay, so logistic underscore reg. So this is how you do logistic regression within tidy models. Okay. So there's two arguments that we need here. Okay. So the first one is penalty. Okay. And that's that value of lambda. Okay. So how much you want to penalize having more uh, coefficients. Okay, so what you can do is you can put in any value of the penalty that you like. Okay, if you have a specific value you want to use. What we're going to do instead is we're going to say, okay, actually, let's tune this model, okay, and pick the best value of, of lambda, of the best value of this penalty. So we can pass in the tune function, okay, to say, to sort of automatically tune it and pick the best value. To make sure that we're doing uh, lasso regression and not just um, sort of standard logistic regression, we want to set mixture uh, equal to one, okay? There are There is another uh, method for uh, sort of penalized regression. Um, called ridge regression uh, that you might want to have a little look at at some point. In tidy models, the way you switch between ridge regression and lasso regression is changing the value of uh, mixture. Okay, And you can do something that's halfway in between the two, but for the purposes of today, if you want to do lasso regression, mixture is equal to one. We also need to tell tidy models which R package we want to use to actually fit the model. Okay, so I kind of touched on this at the beginning. Like tidy models isn't a re-implementation of every R package that already fits models. It essentially uses those existing R packages to fit the models, but helps you tidy up the inputs and the outputs. So if we're fitting lasso regression models in R, the package that you can do that with in base R is called GLM net. Okay? So if we want to do lasso regression in tidy models, we use set engine. Okay? So what engine, um, what R package is doing the work underneath and actually fitting the models, it's GLM net. Okay? And I'm going to save this um, as an object. Okay, so this is the sort of specification of the model, of the lasso model that we're going to use for tuning. And now we actually need to tune the model. Okay, so we said we're going to tune the penalty. We need to tell tidy models um, a little bit more information. Okay, so there's different ways that you can. Um, tune models. Okay, so one of the things we need to tell it is what are we tuning it on? Okay. Well if you remember earlier, we made these cross validation folds. Okay. So that data that we want to be using is our samples of data we want to be using for tuning the model. We also need to decide how we're going to decide which values of lambda to try. Which values of the penalty could we try? Okay, it goes between zero and infinity. Okay, we can't try every possible value that will take us a very, very long time. So do you want to tune them regularly? 
Okay, so maybe you want to go 100, 200, 300, or maybe you think there's a particular um, sort of range of penalty values and you want to try uh, more of those values. Okay, and maybe stuff close to zero and stuff that's really big, you probably don't want to try those very much. Okay, so you can set all of these different things in tidy models. Okay, so let's set up a grid of values of that penalty of lambda that we're going to try. Okay. So to do that, we use the tune grid function. So we have three uh, arguments here. The first thing we want to do is say, which model are we actually tuning? Okay, We might have multiple models going on at once, so we need to say, which one is it? So we use the add model function, and we pass in the workflow that we created earlier. Okay, so this makes sure that all of your pre-processing steps are done. And then we pass in this lasso model that we just created. The second argument we want to specify is resamples. Okay. And that's going to be our cross-validation folds. Okay, so it's the which resamples of the data are you are you testing these values of lambda on? And then how do you want to sample different values of, of lambda? Okay. There's different types of, of grids. Okay. So you can see there's uh, different uh, options within the, the dials package. I'm just going to pick a regular grid. Um, so basically just test uh, regularly spaced values of lambda. There are some models where you might have multiple um, hyperparameters. Here, we've only got one. Okay, so we pass in this penalty function to say that is the thing that we want to, to be checking. And you can set levels equals to say how many different levels of, of lambda do you want to check. Okay, So you might put in 30. Obviously, more is better. Okay, If you check more possible values of uh, lambda, you're more likely to find the best one. But you do have this sort of computational limitation of you can't try every possible value. Okay, So this creates our grid. Okay, And you can see it does take a little second to, to actually run. And if you have a little look at the output for this, okay, what you have is a, a, a data frame uh, with different, um, basically, a nested data frame. So if you remember, we set uh, v equals 10, so 10 different folds in the cross-validation. So we have 10 different rows. So this is in the first fold. It does the split. Okay? And you can see that it's not exactly a perfect uh, same number every time. Okay? And what you get out is, is some metrics. Okay, So you get out things like the accuracy or the ROC curve. What you could do is you could try and wrangle this into a nice data set to get a, a nice uh, graph, for example, or to try and work out which value um, of lambda was best. There's fortunately um, a much nicer way of doing that. So you take uh, this grid and you pass it into the select best function. Okay, So of all the possible values uh, of of lambda that we tried, we want to pick the best one. And we want to, in this case, choose the best one based on uh, the area under the ROC curve. Okay, So you can pick any metric you like um, here. Okay, So if you have a, oh, that should be working. Ah, interesting. I'm going to do. Okay. I will debug that while you're working on exercises because this <laughs> um might be an upgrade to tidy models. Um, but as as you can see, um, if you don't specify a metric. Um, 
it uses ROC by default, okay, because of those issues with accuracy and, and imbalance models, ROC is it's not perfect, but it, it works a little better uh, than some other things. So you can see that what you get out here is a table, okay. Um, the second column you can pretty much ignore, okay. It's not necessarily giving you information that's useful, but what you care about is this bit, okay. So this is saying of all the values of lambda that we checked, the value that worked the best was 0 0.0418. Okay, so this is you tuned your hyperparameter of lambda. Here's the best one. Okay, um, so I'm going to save that as an object. Okay, and that means we can basically save uh, that 0 0.04 and use it elsewhere. So now what we want to do is we know what model we want to fit and we know what value of the hyperparameter we want to use. So let's actually stick those two things together and fit um, uh, a final model. Okay. So in tidy models, uh, we do finalize workflow. Okay. So this is basically saying, okay, we've got our initial workflow. Okay, that's our specified what the outcome was, what the potential explanatory variables were. It's got our pre-processing. And then we stick that together with our sort of lasso model and our best value of lambda. Okay. So we have uh, add model, okay, our standard workflow. Okay, we don't need to change anything to that. Okay, here we're passing in uh, our lasso model that we specified. And we want to pass in the value of the tuning parameter that we want. Okay. And we can call this final lasso. It's just our final fitting of the model. Okay. What we still need to actually do is evaluate it. Okay, so we've done some evaluation metrics to try and figure out what's the best value of lambda, but we still need to assess how well the model is working on the testing set. Okay, so to do that, we essentially want to fit the model one last time. Okay, so we do final lasso. Okay, so we use the last fit. We pass in our final version of the model. And we pass in the split object. And then we say collect metrics. Okay. And you get multiple, you get three um, different metrics out by default. In collect metrics, you can specify which metrics you want. So if you want um, something else, if you wanted kappa or if you wanted the I don't know, false positive rate, you could specify that in collect metrics. So you get the ones that are important to you. Okay. So you can see here, you got um, an ROC of sort of 0.869, which is not terrible. Okay. Um, and an accuracy of about 0.85. Okay. What I would say is a lot of the time, these metrics um, on their own are not necessarily that useful. They're mainly useful when you compare them to another model. Okay. Um, so when we, we come on to fitting the next type of model, um, you, you'll be able to compare the two and kind of use that to choose uh, models. The last thing I want to show you around uh, lasso regression is thinking about which variables are actually the most important. Okay. Because that's one of the things that if you were just doing linear regression, sort of very standard you'd be able to look at the, I guess, the significance of a particular coefficient. You'd also be able to look at the size of a particular coefficient. Okay, So you can say things like, as if year increases by one, what's the change in the probability of the outcome? With lasso regression, you can't interpret coefficients in quite the same way, Okay, because you are shrinking all of the coefficients. You're not just shrinking some to zero. So you can't get quite the same interpretation, but you can oh, um, you can um, 
think about which variables are most important. Okay. Um, which I will show you in a second when posit cloud wakes back up again. Hopefully. Okay, there we go. Okay. So we can use uh, looking at variable importance. Okay. So we take our final lasso model. We fit, if we would look at the fit on the training data. And then there's a couple of helper functions. So one is extract fit parsnip. So actually sort of extract bits, uh, the important bits that we're interested in from our fitted model. And then we can use uh, the VIP package, okay? So this and is looking at variable importance, okay? Uh, so you want to use the VI uh, function here. And we say lambda is equal to uh, the highest uh, ROC value, uh, the penalty that gives that. Okay, So if you run this, okay, what you get out is um, essentially uh, a data frame. Okay, so this is all the possible variables that we put into the model. Okay, so all of the explanatory variables. This gives you a measure of their importance, and then it gives you the sign. So is it positive or negative? So what you can see from this is that actually all but four of the, the uh, explanatory variables have been squashed down to zero. So it's basically saying that these variables here, we don't we don't want to include them in the model. So it's not adding enough based on this penalty. So we only have four non-zero coefficients. So you have two that give you a sort of negative effect, um, and two that give you a positive effect. And it it ranks them by importance. So I will stress again that you can't interpret this in the same way as um standard regression models, but does give you an idea of the importance um, of each variable. Okay, And obviously, you can pass this into um, your favorite plotting uh, package and, and create a sort of graph of which variables are uh, non-zero and which ones are most important if you want to. But for now, it's uh, your turn to have a go at some exercises again. Okay, uh, so you can use uh, the examples as a starting point. So what you're going to do is specify a model using logistic reg, tune the hyperparameter, figure out the best value and fit the final model, and then evaluate the model performance. Okay, so you're doing this for the exercises data that you were using um, in the previous uh, exercise as well. Okay, so again, um, I will uh, have a look and see if there's any questions or if you get stuck, uh, do you just let me know. Okay, so have a go um, at exercise two and fit um, a lasso logistic regression model. And yeah, as um, as being said in the chat, um, I think this is a uh, probably a thing to uh, stop our making assumptions. Um, if you want to specify a particular metric in the select best function, uh, set metric equals. Okay, it will use ROC by by default anyway.
Okay, how are we getting on with exercises? Are you kind of feeling ready to move on or do you want a little bit more time? All good. Okay. Um so as as before, uh the the exercise solutions are both on Posit Cloud and on GitHub as well. Um so you can have a little look at those if you got stuck at any point. What we're going to move on to next is another type of model. So we're going to look at random forests. Okay. So before you have a forest, you have a tree. Okay. So start with a decision tree. So it's basically some tree like model of decisions and the things that might happen based on which decisions you might make. Okay. okay? So you might want to figure out what's the outcome of deciding whether you should walk to work or not. Um, you might ask one question about whether or not it's raining. Based on your answer to that, you might want to figure out, will it rain later? Or you might want to ask, will it be windy later? So you can think of each of these um, questions as being sort of columns, potential variables, and then these different sort of uh, branches coming down as being the values of those variables okay? and leading to a particular outcome. Okay? And essentially what random forests are is lots and lots of trees. Okay? So you combine lots of different decision trees and from each decision tree you'll get some sort of outcome. Okay? So if you follow through this path, okay, so is it raining today? Yes, probably will be windy, so your outcome will be don't walk to work. Okay? So that's, you get one outcome for each decision tree. So if you've got lots and lots of decision trees, you'll have lots and lots of um, sort of results. And then you can take a sort of majority vote or look at an average to get your final result of, from your random forest. Okay? So the nice one of the nice things about random forests is that they are quite flexible. And that means they can be used for either classification problems, so looking at things like binary variables like we're doing today, but you can also use them for regression problems. So you can have continuous outputs from uh, random forests as well. Okay. We're looking at classification tasks, so the output is going to be the, the class selected by most of, of the different trees. Much like lasso regression is we have some other hyperparameters that we're going to need to tune and figure out the best values for. So for random forest, we have um, at least three. So in tidy models, uh, the first one is trees. So how many trees? Okay, the number of trees in the the random forest. You also have uh, m try. Okay, so the number of predictors that you're going to sample at each different split when you're making those tree models. And you also have uh, min n, so the number, minimum number of data points that you need in order for a node to be split further in the tree. Okay. You probably don't, if you've got lots and lots of data, you don't want to end up with um, hundreds and thousands of, of possible outcomes because you've gone down to one uh, point at the end. So let's uh, look at how do we fit random forests in tidy models. Okay, uh, so looking at random forests. Okay, so what we're going to do here is similar to when we're fitting lasso regressions. The, f the first bit is always a, the bit that's the most different, right? Because that's how you specify the model, and the model's the thing that's different. So in tidy models, you use the rand forest function. And we can specify our different uh, hyperparameters and either the values they'll take or whether we want to tune them. Okay, So we might have m try is tune. We have trees is equal to tune. And we have min n is equal to tune. Okay, And you can tune all of them, none of them, or some of them. 
Okay, so if you said actually I want there to be 100 trees, you can set trees is equal to 100. Okay, and it will only tune uh, m try and min n. Okay. With random forests, we have a little extra step here. Um, and that extra step is set mode. Okay, and mode is almost always classification or regression. Okay, so here we want to use it for a classification problem. Okay, we didn't need to do that with the previous model because it was sort of a logistic regression problem, which is for classification. Because random forests could do either, we need to tell it which one we're planning to do. Okay. And then we again set the engine so which R package is underneath the hood doing the actual work. And for random forests, that's the ranger uh, package. Okay. And we can save this as a random forest model. Okay. And then, as with the previous model, we want to tune those hyperparameters. Okay. And again, we're going to create a grid of possible values. Okay. So let's create our random forest grid. Okay. So again, it's going to be tune grid and then add model and our workflow and then our uh, random forest model that we just specified. Again, we want those resamples to come from the cross validation folds we made earlier. And then we have grid equals grid regular and we specify um, which uh, sort of uh, hyperparameters we're tuning here. Okay, so we might have uh, m try, uh, min n, and we can specify uh, levels. Okay, so this creates, a, I guess, a sort of two dimensional grid. So it's a combination of these different values and which combination of these hyperparameters gives you the best performance. Okay, so it is doing them. Um, sort of jointly as a grid is not in separately, independently choosing the best hyperparameter for each one. It's the combination of hyperparameters. Okay. What you can do as well is specify a particular range of values to, to look at. Okay, So if you remember that m try is the number of uh, sort of variables and the number of columns to sample. you could set range is equal to, and then just a vector, okay? So if you always want to sample between five and eight, put in five and eight, okay? So I think, I can't remember, I think there's something like uh, 11 uh, variables in the model. So you could go um, some range essentially between one and 11 here, okay? Um, there is one question in the chat um, asking, do I need to put the number of trees in here as well? You could, it depends if you want to tune it. Okay, so if I had trees equals tune here, then yes, I would also say tune the trees in here. But if I specified trees as being a fixed value and I don't want to tune it, um, then we, we don't want to try and tune it here. Okay, random forest models do take quite a, a little bit to train. Um, so for the purposes of this, I'm going to pick quite a small number of values here. Okay. Um, definitely choose a higher number of values in real life. Okay. Okay. So this, this has sort of tuned our, our values. And again, the process that we're going to do is going to be very similar. What we want to know is what's the best values of m try and min n from the ones that we, we looked at. Okay. So we take our grid and we use select best, okay, metric equals ROC uh, underscore area under the curve, okay, and you can see here you're getting three columns, so it's sort of saying uh, m try the best value is seven, min n best value is twenty one, okay. Um, the 
default range um, for min n is uh, between, it looks for values between 2 and 40. Right? If this min n came back and was 40, you would probably want to increase the range because it's sort of saying, you know, the best value is the last possible one you tried. Probably try some extra ones as well. Okay. So let's uh, save this um, so we can use it uh, later again. And then again, we'll fit our final random forest okay, using finalize workflow. Add the model with the workflow um, and the tuning spec RF model that we created at the top and fit it with those um, best hyperparameters. Okay. And then the last thing we want to do again is going to be evaluate that model. So it's going to be last fit final random forest to that split of the data and collect the metrics. Okay. okay. And you get your same metrics out as before in the nice same rectangular data frame format. So I'm hoping that what you'll start to notice now is that the process for fitting a random forest model was very, very similar to the process for fitting a lasso regression. Okay, They are very different types of models. They work entirely differently. But in the sort of tidy models framework, the process is very similar. Okay, This first part is a bit that's different. Okay? You specify which particular function, look at setting the mode or setting the engine, create some sort of tuning grid, Okay, and you're passing in this. It's very kind of repetitive code almost. So you're adding the model, your resamples, your grid, select the best values of your hyperparameters, finalize the workflow, and then evaluate it with the last fit and collect metrics. So there are very different packages underneath the GLM net and uh, Ranger, but with tidy models, you get this very sort of consistent output. Okay, It's quite easy to compare this to the previous uh, output we got from the lasso regression. With random forest, there is um, one additional kind of easy way um, to to look at evaluating models. So at the moment, we've um, you know we sort of printed out the accuracy or the the area under the curve, and you can look at other metrics. It's quite nice to visualize that, and a, a really common way of visualizing results for binary classification problems are confusion matrices. So how many true positives, false positives, um, and so on. So what we can do with this is with the last bit, instead of collecting the metrics, collect the predictions. Okay? So for that uh, testing split, what predictions did you actually get? And pass that into the conf mat function, okay, so confusion matrix. And you're comparing uh, death in the, the original uh, data set in the testing one. And you can look at the predicted class from the collected predictions. And the nicer thing about that is that you can auto plot it. Okay, So you get this sort of confusion matrix. Okay, So it is sort of scaled by the the number of very uh, number of observations in each class. Okay, so you can see that the majority of observations uh, are zero, and that the majority of the predictions are also zero. Okay, probably a little bit imbalanced here. Okay, so we're probably missing some of the ones. Okay, so the width of of this is uh, would probably be up to around here. Okay, so it's kind of an easy way to get a plot out of what your predictions look like and how well your predictions are doing. Okay. Um, so it is once again your turn again uh, to, to do some R code. Um, so if you have a look at exercise uh, number three, okay, again, you can use the examples I'm working 
through as a sort of starting point because you're doing something kind of similar, but you want to be specifying a random forest model uh, using that rand forest function. Tune the hyperparameters or choose some particular values of the hyperparameters um, to fit your model, then fit your final model and evaluate it. Okay, so have a look at the metrics um, and maybe have a look at those confusion matrices as well. Uh, yeah, so I think, um, I think, I think the examples ones here are blank. Cause I think my, yeah, my original plan was to use these as prompts for myself, but I think I've just gone through it in my head. So what I'll do is I, um, everything, all the examples are basically in the examples dot uh, one as well. And if you go on to GitHub as well, um, you should go see examples. Um, 
if you go into examples one, there's it's not identical to what I've, I've written today, but it is um, there if you want a copy of the examples. Um, but I think I've just put it all into everything we did today. I think I put it into one big script rather than uh, four little scripts. Um, so it is all there. How, how are we doing with exercises? Just want a, little, a few more minutes. Uh, yeah, I can, we can go over the confusion uh, matrix again. Um, so it should be in here. Okay. Um, so on the X axis is your true values. Okay. Um, so if you remember back to the, the bar plots we made right at the beginning, you had about two thirds of your, your data were zeros and then about a third were ones. And then if you're looking on the y-axis, this is essentially how many um, zeros did you predict versus how many ones did you predict? So what I'm kind of looking at is what is the relative width of the, the zeros in the predictions versus the relative width um, of the zeros in, in the truth. And actually, if you look at the sort of raw values in the confusion matrix as well, um, you can see, okay, so there were 38 zeros that you correctly said were zero. There were seven ones that you incorrectly said were zeros. There were four zeros that you incorrectly said were ones. Okay, so these are um four four people who didn't die but that you predicted they would. Okay. And then there's eleven that you correctly predicted um would. Okay. So that's kind of what the confusion matrix is showing is that most of them were zeros, both in sort of truth and prediction. So it's these sort of corner ones. You want these corners to be as small as possible because the, the bottom left and the top right here are the the incorrect classification. So you want these two to be as small as possible, basically. Okay, I am aware we have just over five uh, minutes left. Um, I know there's another question in the chat, which I will try to come back to. Um, so I'm hoping that what you've seen is that we've fitted two very different models with tidy models. But that after that initial processing step, we didn't really have to reformat our data in any way. And the results we got out at the end were also nicely formatted. And it was quite easy to compare between uh, the two different models. Okay. Um, I have included a, a third example um, in here, which we don't have time to go through. But there is a code on GitHub. Um, for an example, looking at support vector machines as well. Okay, so with support vector machines, um, essentially plot your data and draw the best line that separates the two groups. Okay, um, so there are some examples um, on GitHub in the examples of 
how do you fit support vector machines with tidy models? And it's very similar to everything uh, we've done today. So if that's something you're interested in, or if you just want some more examples to go through afterwards on in your own time, um, do you have a look at, at the code for the support vector machines as well? Um, what I kind of wanted to, to end with um, was, where do you go from here? Okay, you kind of come to a two-hour workshop and the idea is ideally you're going to go and use it. And when you go and use it, there's going to be other things that you're probably going to have to learn or stuff that's not quite familiar. Um, because there's lots of both machine learning topics and tidy models, things that we, we just haven't had time to cover today. Um, so when you're thinking about machine learning, um, it's important to also be thinking about ethics, thinking about sort of uh, bias in your models or discrimination that might be sort of amplified by some of the models. Other things that are important to think about is explainability um, and how do you validate models. So with the, the lasso regression, you have that explainability factor because you can kind of look at variable importance and people can draw a little bit of a comparison to regression and, and how do you understand which variables were driving the predictions. Whereas with random forests, that's a little bit harder to do. It's a little bit more of a black box if you don't necessarily know what's going on. So it's important to be thinking about um, these topics when you're building machine learning models that you're actually going to be using. In terms of additional resources, um, the tidy models documentation is very, very good. Um, there's lots of examples for lots of different packages. The tidy modeling with our book is um, also very, very good. And again, has lots of examples and kind of explains uh, different types of models. Um, so it's kind of coming, I guess, more from the modeling side rather than from the, the code side of it a little bit. Um, Julia, um, who's one of the co-authors of um, Tidy Modeling with R, also has a blog post, and she writes some wonderful blog posts um, every week. Um, and she also does them as our YouTube videos. So if reading is is not your thing, but you prefer watching videos, um, there's some really nice uh, posts by Julia about how Tidy Models works with different types of models and different types of data. Um, the Tidyverse blog itself is also quite a nice place to have a little look at. So. Um, I wanted to highlight this blog post because it comes back to the previous slide um, about evaluating models. So when we've looked at evaluating models today, we've essentially looked at which one um, gives the sort of most accurate predictions or which ones are the best area under the curve. Um, but looking at whether machine learning models are fair is also really important. And I think is especially important in things like healthcare. Um, and so, one of the, the sort of developments in tidy models that's happened quite recently is looking at metrics for fairness and implementing these. So you can choose uh, a model, not necessarily based on how accurate it is, but looking at which model is the fairest. And this is quite new. This is sort of in the last um, just two months. Um, but if there's any big updates to uh, tidy models, there tends to be a blog post um, on the Tidyverse blog. So you can have a look there. Um, and just a reminder that the workshop resources are um, online. So all of the code um, is on GitHub um, and these slides are available as well and they will sort of just stay available online. Okay, um, if you do have any questions um, that still exist, please feel free to, to reach out. I'm also on the NHSR Slack. So if you have questions there, that's a, a good place to ask as well. But otherwise, thank you very much. See if there are any questions. There's lots of thank yous. There's quite a lot of information that I hadn't realised. If you go onto YouTube, the NHSR YouTube, and do tidy models, there's a lot of videos from other people throughout the community. And we have had a talk from Julius Hilms at one of the conferences. So it looks like it's been around. And yeah. it's one of those things I think that people can catch up when it's something that they need, yeah. that they're working on. And it's really great to have you as part of the Slack as well so that we know where you are to get some feedback too. So thank you so much. On behalf of everybody who's been here and who will catch up later, I'm going to end the recording. Massive thanks, Nicola. Oh, I kept that Thank one. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs>